So I'm going to talk about the Casimir effect today. And um, let me tell you what the interest in it really is. Well, there are actually several interests. Um, the first thing is that neutral objects in general attract each other. And I'm not talking about gravity. I'm talking about um, electromagnetically. In particular, if you have two hydrogen atoms, then they are, they have, if you uh, assign them the usual ground state wave function so that they're symmetric distributions, uh, what's actually overlooked in treatments of this problem, uh, most treatments at least, is that there's a first order perturbation theory effect that's simply given by the, uh, well, let's see, if you have, I don't know, I might call this one R1 and then R2 and this distance here, say R, then the perturbation is something like and I'm using you know, natural units, and I'm avoiding four pi since I'm not looking at this uh, carefully. You've got um, one over R1 plus, R1, I should say, minus R minus R2. So that's the repulsion between these two. Then you have the repulsion between the two protons, which of course is just one over R. And then you have the attraction like this, which is minus 1 over R1 minus R, and then this attraction, which is minus 1 over uh, R plus R2. So in, with that choice of coordinates, that's the um, perturbation, because this term is trivial if you're doing the quantum mechanical calculation. But if you work that out, you get a term of uh, 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 an energy that's, um, well, it's of course very complicated, but in a certain limit, it's uh, minus e squared over r is over capital R to the sixth, apart from some factors. And um, then there's a second order, in second order perturbation theory, you get the usual, what's called the van der Waals effect. But the two together really form the Van der Waals effect, the long range uh, force. Um, but when I say long range, I'm talking few angstroms. When you get beyond a few angstroms, then um, you need to take into account the retardation. And, uh, and then again, you're doing second order perturbation theory and retardation, you get one over r to the seventh. In any event, this is why um, hydrogen is H2, not H, and nitrogen is M2, oxygen, O2, and so forth. And the binding energy is not trivial. It's around, my memory is around 5 EV for hydrogen. But it's something like 10 for nitrogen. Okay, um, the second thing is though, uh, at, at somewhat longer distances, um, as I said, the, the, the force is, you can take into account retardation, but um, other things come into play. And um, so when you're building nanoscale objects, you need to worry about neutral objects uh, tracking, or even in some certain, some geometries repelling each other. So um, nanoscale uh, effects. And um, these are coming in, these have um, applications in biophysics and uh, also uh, in um, uh, semiconductors. 
because the scale of Intel is going down to 22 nanometers now. Um, but the third thing is, what is the vacuum energy? Is it, for example, is the Hamiltonian uh, an integral a dagger k, a k, d cubed k, or is it a dagger k, a k, well, sorry, or maybe a k, or is it a dagger k, a k plus a half omega k, d cubed k. I'm writing it for bosons. If we're talking bosons or fermions, for fermions you get a minus sign. And um, so this is a um, uh, question if, yeah. Sorry, the minus sign for the fermions comes from? Okay. That they're, they enter the field anti-commute and um, it, it it just works out that way. I don't know if. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Let's, let's see. B for the both, yeah, for the fermionic, B plus the crater Chanel. Let's suppose we just had something like this. Uh, yeah. I'm, I'm not sure this is going to work out, actually. Um, these terms can, so you get B dagger B plus B, B dagger. And B, B dagger is, this is equal to minus B, B dagger. B, right, the, yeah, yeah, the ladder operation. Uh, plus a half. And um, I'm a little puzzled, but um, that's right. Somehow this is coming out to be just one half, or minus one half, perhaps, but. Um, Well, of course, I'm not sure that this is actually what happens when you do the Hamiltonian in, in, in the case of uh, fermions. When, um, it, because this, this particular structure isn't the right one. All right, look, let me not try to do this on the fly. This is complicated. But um, let me just say that I remember the answer. It's plus or minus. And uh, obviously, it has to have that form, the only question. Oh, well. Obviously, I've screwed up here. Plus or minus for one half, not plus or minus the eight half. Okay. Okay. All right. Well, yeah, good you pointed that out. You get at least a try. All right. Um, and of course, this is sort of related to this to, to one of the big questions today, which is dark energy, and. Um, the trouble is, if you try to say that the dark energy density is due to these the zero-point energies, you have really an embarrassing uh, uh, feature because what you'd have one, then was, would be that the energy would be one-half omega k d q k, and this, and if the cutoff is lambda, this is something like lambda to the fourth, so it's infinity to the fourth power. And you need to compare that with the actual energy density of um, the dark energy, which is less than an EV to the fourth. In fact, it's somewhere in the milli EV range. So um, few mu milli EV to the fourth. Well, that means the cutoff has to be of the order of a milli-electron volt, which is absurd because we know the perturbation theory work. We know what's going on in physics down up to energies of the order of a TeV. And um, we don't need any cutoff up to a TeV. So something very puzzling is going on. Um, the, the, one of the early hopes with supersymmetry is that if you have a boson mode for each fermion mode, well, then uh, these one-half omegas cancel because you have, uh, if you have as many boson modes as fermion modes, then uh, these things cancel. If the masses don't match, they don't fully cancel, but the worst part cancels, and this becomes m squared lambda squared 
where m is the symmetry breaking uh, scale. In other words, we the, the standard view of supersymmetry is that it's broken because we don't see the supersymmetric partners. And um, but this becomes even worse because then when we set this to m e v to the fourth, we've got that lambda squared is of the order of m e v over m squared times m e v squared. And this is a very tiny ratio. So supersymmetry doesn't help, it makes it even worse. Um, so this is, this is very, very, very puzzling. And um, anyway, the only evidence, as far as I know, for keeping the one half, uh, rather than saying, well, we'll just normally order the thing and be done with it. Um, the only evidence comes from the Casimir effect. And I'm going to go through that computation today. Um, <coughs> yeah. So, question. So, um, I guess the zero point energy you, you get because of the, uh, the canonical, canonical computation rules from the creation and the annihilation operation. Yeah, in, in fact, what we're talking well, about now, we're just talking about electrodynamics. So in an appropriate set of natural units, this thing is E squared plus B squared. Right. D cubed X. And then when you're done, you get a sum over polarizations and momenta, omega K, AK dagger, AK, and then plus a half if you symmetrically order the annihilation right. creation operator. Right. Um, and uh, but that zero-point energy doesn't affect dynamics, right? It, right, 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 right. It has no effect on anything. So does and in fact, the standard way of doing perturbation theory, so I don't know if I, I don't think I emphasized this when we were doing the Feynman diagram calculations, is that the, we always took the interaction Hamiltonian and normally ordered it so that we didn't have any extra terms coming from just the ordering of the operators. So the normal way to do perturbation theory, or at least the simplest way, the way Weinberg does it in his volume one, is to normally order the interaction Hamiltonian. So then all the Feynman diagrams come out um, reflecting the normal order, so they're simple. So does that mean that when we excite uh, modes in a, in a field, you know, beyond the, 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 uh, the ground state of the field, uh, the zero point energy disappears. That's something I've never understood. What happens if um, what happens when we have something you know beyond the vacuum, just even just one particle, even you know, just one quantum of field? Well, yeah. Well, all right. The idea is that the one particle is represented by a state k such that a k dagger a k is just equal to k, and so the Hamiltonian on that. H on the state K then is just omega K times K. Even if we do have the zero point energy in the Hamiltonian. Oh, if you have the zero point energy in the Hamiltonian, then it's this plus plus any to the fourth power. So people then just draw uh, just drop it. The conventional it thing to do was just to drop the infinity, and because uh, justifying it by because saying, it, it had no it had no right. effect on anything. Right. It's okay. like adding a constant to the Hamiltonian, and you're always doing that in mechanics or electric like that. Right, right, right. Or, okay. The problem comes when, when you're dealing with uh, gravity, then if, in, if empty space has an energy density, then that has big cosmological effects. And now we see there is apparently an, an energy density to empty space, so it's very small. All right, thank you. And the, so the question is, how the hell do you get from Infinity to the fourth, to milli electron volts to the fourth. So it's a, it's a, it's a big, and and the, the, as I said, the puzzling thing about it is, I mean, if you if if you don't realize that you need a cutoff uh, distance of the order of a micron, I mean, the size of a eukaryotic cell, for God's sakes, then um, 
then you know you could just say, oh, we'll put a cutoff, you know, at the Planck scale. The Planck scale cutoff doesn't help with this. You need a milli electron volt cutoff, mm -hmm. and that's what's the real puzzle. All right. So enough with all of that. There's a very nice formula which I'm going to go through now. It's this complex variable theory, and um, it was first applied to the Casimir effect by some Russian named Magnayev or something in 1976. Um, and uh, so let me, and, and it, it, uh, there's a very nice treatment of it in Whitaker and Watson, um, page 145 to 146. Actually, they don't treat it, but at least they state it correctly. Whereas many of the papers on this Casimir effect just give you a, an incorrect version of it. All right, I want to look at two contours. Um, let n1 and n2 be integers. In fact, make them positive integers. And uh, so let's draw the complex plane. So then we've got n1 here n1 plus 1 up to n2. And I'm going to draw the following contours. Down, quarter circle, half circle, half circle, and so forth. Quarter circle, up to infinity, across and down. That's, that is, I'm going to call C plus. Then we're going to have one down here, which is, which is going to be, um, let's see, both are counterclockwise. So this guy is going this way. C minus. So we have two contours. They're just straight lines. This is up at, at, at uh, I infinity minus I infinity. Now I'm going to call these integrals I plus or minus, and they're going to be the integral C plus or minus of a function f of z divided by e to the minus or plus 2 pi i z minus 1 tz, where f of z is analytic in right half plane. So f of z is analytic in this region. So these are contours in the region. They're both closed contours in the domain of analyticity. Uh, this denominator has poles, but the poles are at integers along the real axis. We're avoiding those integers. So these guys are both zero. Okay, we have two contour integrals for both zero. Now, the next thing to notice is that in the, on the curve C plus, where Z is equal to basically I infinity, this thing is E to the minus 2 pi I, I infinity. So that's E to the 2 pi infinity. Not as big as lambda to the fourth, but still enough so that we can neglect this uh, leg of the contour of, of C plus. And moreover, for contour C minus, you've got a minus sign here, and um, but on the other hand, z is equal to minus i infinity, and so you, this one can also be neglected. So we can we can effectively neglect these two contours. That means then that if we take zero, which is i plus minus i minus, the difference of the two 
what do we get? Well, we can write it as three terms. Tx plus T1 plus T2. Tx is the C plus minus the C minus. So effectively, it's the bumpy line integral along the, just above the poles and a bumpy line integral in the same direction, just above the poles, just below the poles. And the result is that Tx is composed of two terms, Ix plus S. The Ix, as you shrink the semicircles to zero, you can see that Ix is just the following. Ix is just an integral from n1 to n2 of f of x, 1 over e to the minus 2 pi i z, this is from c minus, minus 1, plus, and it's plus because we're subtracting c minus, so the thing is going that way, e to the 2 pi i z, minus 1 d, well, I'm saying dx here. In fact, I should replace z by uh, x, so that's a typo here. So y is 0 here, so this is really x. Okay, well, a little algebra shows us that this is n1 to n2 f of x, but now if we complete this square, or complete this sum, we get e to the 2 pi i x minus 1 plus e to the minus 2 pi i x minus 1 divided by the product of these denominators, dx. The product of denominators, the product of these two is 1 product of these two is 1. And then we get minus e to the 2 pi i x minus e to the minus 2 pi i x. So that's what we get. Now you see this is just a remarkable simplification because the numerator is minus the denominator. So this is just minus the integral n1 to n2 f of x dx. All right. So that's that. Now what is S? Well, S is going to be pretty simple. S is a sum um, of various terms. Um, S sub, sub, sub n, where n goes from n1 to n2. If we pick an n less than n2 and greater than n1, then we're dealing with an integral like that minus the integral like this minus that integral and um, so consequently so minus this so the integral is this um, that Epsilon e to the i theta. That's the uh, 
integration we're doing, and dz then is um, i epsilon e to the i theta t theta. Now, and then what we can do, since obviously e to the plus or minus 2 pi i n is equal to 1, we can replace z here by z minus n. And over here, z minus n. And then when we expand these denominators, um, the first term, z is very close to n, so the first term just cancels the 1. So we get minus 2 pi i z minus n. Actually, it's, I don't even need to do this. I'll just use the Cauchy's theorem. Uh, so now we have f of z dz. Now in this case, this is uh, 2 pi i z minus n. Again, the 1 cancels. And so because of this minus sign, this is then the counterclockwise upper integral f of z dz, 1 over 2 pi i, z minus n. And then this one is, hold on, I've got something wrong. Yeah, that one's a part of that. And now the minus sign can reverse this, so we get plus 1 over 2 pi i, uh, going this way now, integral f of z dz over z minus n. And then adding the two together, you see we have just 1 over 2 pi i, just the integral around n of f of z dz over z minus n. And that's just f of n, because the thing is analytic. Standard Cauchy model. All right. Um, the the other case is when we have the quarter inter, uh, the quarter uh, circles, and I'm clearly they just give one half. Instead of f of n one, you get a half f of n one. You get half f of n two. And so this sum here is sum n1 plus 1, n2 minus 1, f of n, plus a half, f of n1, plus f of n2. So that's then what um, ix is I or Tx is that Tx then is is this Tx in other words is equal to S the sum that I just wrote minus the integral n1 to n2 f of x dx and so you see what we're getting here is a an analytic formula for the difference between a sum and an integral. Another way of thinking of it is this sum is the trapezoidal rule for this integral. And we're getting a formula for the difference. Okay. All right, so where the hell was that? All right, now what we're left with is T1 and T2. T1 is an integral down from n1 plus i infinity down to n1, and then from n1 down to n1 minus i infinity. That's t1, and then t2 is the integral from n2 minus i infinity to n2, and then from n2 to n2 plus i infinity. And so that's, so let me write them down. Shouldn't they cancel parallelized? No, but I mean, in some cases they will, but we generally don't. Let's, let's just do it carefully and see what we get. T1 is an integral from n1 plus i infinity to 
to N1, so we're going down. This is the down elevator. E to the minus 2 pi i z minus 1. Minus the integral from N1 to N1 minus i infinity f of z dz over e to the 2 pi i z minus 1. Okay. Now, once again, e to the plus or minus 2 pi i n1 is just equal to 1. So we can replace z by i y. And so this gives us an integral n1 plus i infinity to n1 f of z, this is dz, dz, but now what we have is e i y, so it's e to the 2 pi y minus 1. And the same thing is true. And, and what, is, what is the argument here? It's, it's z, and z is n1 plus i y. Well, let's leave it like that. N1 plus I Y and D Z at the moment here is um, minus I D Y. Um, I Actually, it's dz is actually i dy. We'll get a minus sign when we flip the integration variables. And then over here, we have integral n1, n1 minus i infinity f of n1 minus i y dy over e again to the 2 pi y minus 1. And um, so what we so when we now change these the order of integration and we're integrating then y just from zero to infinity, we get an extra minus sign and then the i, and we get f of n1 plus i y e to the two pi y minus one. Notice that the denominators are the same, and then we're integrating here. Um, let's see, did I, um, right, we're now switching, let's see, if we change to, if we're integrating from zero to infinity, well, what we wind up with is f of n1 minus i y dy over the same denominator. And it comes out with a plus sign. And the reason is that um, effectively, we, we have to replace y by minus y and then um, and then we get an extra minus sign. So this is this is what it turns out to be. Similarly, for let me see how I'm doing on time. For n for t two, you can see you get something similar. Um, t two is the integral from n two to n two plus i infinity f of z dz over e to the minus 2 pi i z minus 1 minus the integral from n2 minus i infinity to n2 f of z dz over e to the 2 pi i z minus 1. Now once again, e to the 2 pi i n2 plus or minus 1, so we can, re we can ignore the x there. And um, what you find then is that this is i integral 0 to infinity 
f of n2 plus i y minus f of n2 minus i y dy over again e to the 2 pi y minus 1. So it's a very similar expression to that. And so when we combine all these things uh, with the equation over here, which is 0 is i plus minus i minus, which is tx plus t1 plus t2, tx being the sum, the trapezoidal sum minus the integral, and then t1 plus t2, we get the Abel-Plana formula, which is 1 half fn1 plus the sum n equals n1 plus 1 to n2 minus 1 f of n plus a half f of n2 minus the integral from n1 to n2 of f of x dx equals i the integral from 0 to infinity. And now we have a very big numerator. We have f of n1 plus i y minus f of n1 minus i1 minus f of n2 plus i1 plus f of n2 minus i1 dy over e to the 2 pi y minus 1. Okay, so that's the uh, Abel-Plana formula. By the way, something tragic about Niels Abel is that his uh, lifespan was 1802 to 1829. I think, along with Galois, he may have been a victim of um, lack of gun control. Um, uh, he was a dual of some sort. All right, so that's the Abel-Plana formula. Uh, a particular example is the case um, f of x just equals x, or 1 f of z is just z. Then what you see is that these guys just cancel. You get the n1s obviously canceling and the n2 canceling. But here you have 2iy here and then minus 2iy there. So in fact, the correction term vanishes for this case. And then what you get is just simply uh, n1 plus n2 over 2 plus the sum of n from n1 plus 1 to n2 minus 1 is equal to the integral of x dx from n1 to n2. So this is a case where the trapezoidal rule is in fact exact because the integral is so simple. The, um, that's the Abel-Plana formula, and the nice thing about it is it, give us, it gives us an expression for the difference between the sum and an integral, and that's what we want to apply now to the Kazimir type. Let me just get um, some I assume it would be valid for any countable set. I'm sorry, give me that again. Uh, it's, uh, this is specifically for integers. Yes. But it seems like it would be valid for any countable set. I don't know. We did use that trick of e to the 2 pi i n equals 1. So I'm not sure what happens. Point, point. Point, point. Point, point. Why don't I owe you a chore? Are you hungry? Uh, no, I can wait. All right. Next time I'm up there, remind me. All right. So we're looking at two plates. Say they're a distance L apart. They have an area A. 
and we're imagining that they're metal plates. And um, at first, we'll say, well, they're perfectly conducting. Well, if they're perfectly conducting, then you can't have a parallel electric field or a perpendicular magnetic field. And so the boundary conditions are ET equals B normal equals zero on surface of metal. Surfaces of metal. So that means there and there. And of course we imagine that A is the area is much bigger than L squared. All right, well, the modes that satisfy these boundary conditions then are quantized here. That is, you can have this mode, you can have that mode, and so forth, but you can't have a mode that doesn't have a node here. And so the, whereas the, the, the k that's in the x and y direction, those are unrestricted. So the frequencies or the energies, omega uh, or omega k per, and then a quantization integer, would be c square root of k per squared vector, two vector, plus pi n over l squared. So the idea is that this this function here is then sine um, x. Well, let me get it right. Sine x over L n pi. So when n is equal to zero, of course, it vanishes. When n is equal to L, it's n pi, and it also vanishes. And um, so we say that's sine of um, k sub n x. So k sub n is uh, pi n over L, which is what we've got here. All right. So then. What's the, what is the energy per unit area? E of L divided by A. It turns out, I'm, I, I guess I should have worked this out in detail for you, but it would, it's, it's basically the difference between the sum over the modes and the integral over the modes. In other words, if you don't have the plates here, then you don't have this quantization condition and you just integrate over all wave numbers. And so the difference between the two is the physical effect. So you expect pi, you get pi h bar c over L, and you have an integral up to some k max. Now what I, what I need to say is that if you have a real metal plate, then these boundary conditions work up to a certain energy. Or so distance scale, um, that is to say, inverse distance, that is to say, when you get to wavelengths of the order of the interatomic spacing of the atoms in the metal, you don't expect the boundary conditions to hold. But in fact, they, hold, they, they stop even before that. Um, it's not clear, it depends on the temperature and the metal and so forth. And uh, they fall off as Epsilon basically is, um, goes as um, one plus some constant over omega squared divided by some omega plasma squared, the plasma frequency of the plate. And it's, so it's something like that. And, and um, so as this goes to infinity, this thing goes to one. This is the high frequency limit. What is A then? A is just a number. I don't know what the number is. It depends on the metal. What's the book? Oh, really? Hmm. OK. Um, and so what we have then is now the modes in the K plus, in the, I, I've switched to polar coordinates here. And we divide by 2 pi. Now we've got a sum up to some maximum integer from n equals 0. And we have square root of uh, L squared, k perp squared, over pi squared, plus n squared. So I factored out a 
the um, pi over L squared. And then we have minus the integral from 0 to n sub m. Square root of L squared k perp squared over pi squared plus x squared dx. So this is the continuum contribution. Where does the maximum k and m n come from? Why is there a maximum? I'm 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 putting okay. What I'm doing is I'm picking a value at which the the uh, boundary conditions have sort of half failed. Okay. In, in other words, we we've got to do something about a cutoff here. In fact, what I'm going to do is I'm going to introduce a smooth cutoff, which is better. But you, clearly what you need is a smooth cutoff. It needs to be something like this, and it needs to happen somewhere in the infrared, the visible, uh, the ultraviolet, or the x-ray, somewhere in that region, because it's a pretty broad region. But then somewhere in there, the thing falls off. It, it will turn out that it's not going to be sensitive to that because of the alo plot If we didn't have that, it would be very sensitive. And there's one more term here. L k perp over 2 pi. That's because when n is equal to 0, um, one of the two modes doesn't uh, exist. And so we, 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 you see, we have two polarizations normally, right? This massless particles are have two degree, two polarizations. One of the polarizations doesn't work in the um, n equals zero case, and the n equals zero case, of course, is going this way, and so you can't have the electric field going. Uh, suppose the photon is coming out of here. Then, um, if the electric field is parallel and the magnetic field perpendicular, that one's a no-no. But you could have the magnetic field going this way, the electric field that way. That would be okay. Right. So that's the reason for this last one. Um, excuse me, Kevin. Uh, so something I've been wondering: um, at what point here did uh, field theory come up, or where is it, or should it come up? Because I, I correct me if I'm wrong, but I think the uh, in order to derive this expression, all you would have needed is uh, Planck's hypothesis, right? That's the only non-classical... Well, we're, 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 we're just using um, omega a dagger a plus a half. That's the quantum part. Otherwise, it's completely classical. All right, so that's the expression. Um, I don't know why I used x here. I should have used, I don't know, some variable that looked more like that. But anyway, finally we get pi, not finally, pi squared h bar c over 2L cubed. And now we have an integral up to p sub m. I'm just changing variables here. P, 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 sum 0 to nm, square root of p squared plus n squared minus the integral 0 to xm, square root of p squared plus x squared dx minus p over 2. Okay, so these are slightly nicer units. Notice that whatever this is, it's a number, and you get 1 over L cubed. That's, that's what's necessary for dimensional analysis, and uh, it's the right power of that. All right, now I want to introduce a cutoff, and the cutoff I'm going to pick a cutoff that has a nice form. 1 plus n over nm plus n over nm squared. Now this, this is just, um, the nice thing about this cutoff is that the poles that one can think of this and one can promote this to an analytic function, 1 over 1 plus z, let me see, z over nm plus z squared over nm squared. 
And then what you can see is that the poles of this thing are in the left-hand plane. So see, this thing is analytic in right-half plane. In other words, you set this equal to 0, you get 1 plus z over n plus z squared over n squared equals 0. The roots are z is equal to minus 1 over n. So that's the part we really want. Plus or minus square root of b squared, that's 1 over n squared, minus uh, 4 over n squared divided by uh, 2 over n squared, I guess. Right. And so these guys are imaginary. This is negative. And so the poles are in that temporal length of power, actually, now that I think about it. There's a 1 half. And then it's minus n plus or minus um, uh, I've got n squared. Um, well, it's again n. The, the n comes out. So it's just going to be an n. And this is. Um, I root three. So that's where they are. They're somewhere. So n is big. So they're way the hell out of here. And then they're they're actually they're sort of one up there and one down there. Now, um, obviously, I just picked this function out of my nose because I just wanted the poles in the left hand plane, left half plane. But it's roughly the uh, correct uh, dependence on the treatment. So it's obviously with a little work you can get something that's analytic, has the pole uh, analytic in the right half plane, and is as close as you want to whatever the function is that you want. The cutoff function. All right. So now I'm going to say m is an integer. Uh, much bigger than nm. So we can, in other words, the energy difference now, if we put in the cutoff, in fact, let me not use up this much board, this simple formula, so just get rid of this. So now, putting in the cutoff, we have a more accurate formula, actually. It's pi squared for a real metal, at least. Pi squared over h plus c over 2L cubed, integral 0 to m, pdp, sum 0 to m, n equals 0 to m, c of n, square root of p squared plus n squared, minus integral 0 to m, c of x, square root of p squared plus x squared, dx minus p over <coughs> So, so now, um, this, uh, in fact, this is actually a more physically realistic formula than the original one that I wrote down with the sharp cutoff. This one is sort of plausible. And um, what, what it says then is that for values of n much less than capital N, much less than n sub n, In other words, where the boundary conditions start to fail, start to really fail significantly, for for value for integers lower than that, then c is one, and we have the whole difference. Then, during this region of failure, c gradually goes down to zero, and then we integrate out all the way out to m, where m is some big number, whereupon c is essentially negligible. So that's that's the idea. All right, and now this function f of z that we're using then is c of z square root of p squared plus z squared. And then this is 
square root of p squared plus z squared, and now it's divided by 1 plus z over n sub n plus z squared over n sub n squared. So clearly, this goes to 0 as x goes to infinity. That is to say, as the real part of z goes to infinity, that goes to 0. And it goes to 0 as basically 1 over x. So this x squared here is just an x in um, OK, so what does the, uh, so now we can apply the Avoplana formula. And we're going to be applying it to this difference. Um, And what we get is the following. We get that then the e, e L over A is pi squared H bar C over 2L cubed integral 0 to M C of P P D P. Oh, I forgot there's a C of P here also. I stuck a C of P in here just to cut off uh, the loads in the in that direction as well. It's not going to be important anyway. And then here we have Cm over 2 square root of p squared plus m squared plus i integral 0 to infinity C of i y square root of p squared plus epsilon plus i y squared minus c of minus i y square root of p squared plus epsilon minus i y squared minus c of m plus i y square root of p squared plus m plus i y squared uh, plus C of M minus I Y square root of P squared plus M minus I Y squared. And um, then I need to multiply that whole thing and it goes back all the way to there. So this is a square. This is a bracket. This bracket and that bracket are the same. And then I've run out of blackboard. But what we have here, so let me just put an arrow there. We have dy over e to the 2 pi y minus 1. And then curly bracket. This curly bracket is that curly bracket. So that's what we've got. These notes are in the are, are online. Um, now, clearly, this thing is negligible because we're way, way out at, um, at M. And M is a, is a huge number at which C is negligible. Moreover, we also have, as we integrate on Y, we have E to the 2 pi Y in the denominator. So these terms are completely negligible. Um, these terms, uh, on the other hand, um, Aren't and so what we have then is p e of l over a is i squared h bar c over 2l cubed integral 0 to m c of p dp and i integral 0 to infinity c of i y square root p squared plus epsilon plus i y squared minus c of minus i y square root of p squared plus epsilon minus i y squared dy dy over e to the 2 pi y minus 1 i. So that's our expression at this stage. Okay, now, um, Notice that this integration is damped by e to the 2 pi y in the denominator. 
and we're integrating on the y-axis. The epsilons, by the way, are just to tell us that as we're integrating along the, um, my goodness, I've somehow, that's right. You see, N1 in this, I should have mentioned something over here. N1 we're taking to be zero. N2 is M. That's the way we apply Avopana. And um, so these epsilons are just to tell us that for this N1, we're staying in the right-hand plane. So we're integrating in this way just a tiny bit, to an infinitesimally to the right of the y-axis. All right. Now, because of the y here, by the time c is different from 1, remember c has this form such that uh, c of i y is 1 plus i y over n m minus y squared over n m squared. So until y is substantial, c is essentially 1. So we can just replace c by 1 in these two cases. Um, now, what is the difference of the square roots? Well, for if y is less than p, what, one question. Well, yeah. uh, how can we replace it by one when we get to infinity? It's certainly not. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But there, who cares? Because it's blown away okay. by an exponential. Okay. All right. So for y less than p, what are these square roots? Well, for y less than p, this is p squared minus y squared. This is p squared minus y squared. These are both 1. They cancel. On the other hand, for y greater than p, so cancel. For y greater than p, square root of p squared, this thing, well, p squared plus epsilon plus or minus i y squared is square root of p squared minus y squared uh, plus or minus 2 epsilon i y. Okay, so and but now y, so this is negative, this is negative real part, so we're talking about points here or here. So plus or minus, so it's there or there, and they differ by a minus sign. So this is equal to plus or minus i square root of y squared minus p squared. Okay. Is the, you have a cut on the negative y axis for the square root, so this is, remember the square root of z is square root of r e to the i theta so this is square root of r e to the i theta over 2. And the question is, what's theta? Well, theta is pi over 2, is pi here minus pi there. And this is the theta cut, is what the cut really is. All right. So that means that this integration here is pi squared h bar c over 2l cubed integral 0 to m, c of t, p, dp, integral 0 to infinity minus 2 square root of y squared minus p squared times theta of y minus p over e to the 2 pi y minus 1 dy. The heavy side function, this is 1 when y is greater than p, 0 otherwise, and that's because when P is greater than Y, the, the square roots cancel. So effectively then, this is equal to minus pi squared h bar c over L Q integral 0 to, well, this P can't get any bigger than Y, so this is only up to Y. PDP, and since we're only going up to y, um, and since y is damped, uh, we can ignore the departure of C of P from unity. And so this is then integral 0 to infinity 
square root of y squared minus p squared dy e to the 2 pi y minus 1. So this guarantees that p is less than, or that y is greater than p. And now what one does is one does the p integral first, and this then gives minus pi squared h bar c over 3 L cubed, integral 0 to infinity, y cubed, dy. P integration is elementary because it's PDP and P squared, so this is a trivial integration. E to the 2 pi y minus 1. Well, we recognize this as uh, the um, second Bernoulli number. And so this is, which is 1 over 30. And so this is minus pi squared h bar c v2 over 3l squared. Well, it's an 8, for Newton number over 8. And uh, that's 1 over 30. And so this is minus pi squared h bar c over 720l cubed. Now, the, the pressure then is minus 1 over A, partial of E, partial L, and that gives minus pi squared H bar C over 240 L cubed. And this is the result due to Casimir. Um, I think it was 1948, actually. He only died about 11 years ago. He died in the year 2000. Born in 1909, so he was 91. So that's the, the value, and um, as I said, he, did, he published this in about 48, I think. And um, nine years later, a guy named Sparnay did some experiments and showed that this was basically right, uh, at least experimentally, more or less. And I'm not, um, In other words, the, the, the experiments since then have, have basically shown that uh, the departure from this result is basically consistent with the metals not being perfect metals, so on and so forth. Okay, the, the thing though that's really disturbing, or at, at least puzzling, let me say, I'm, disturbing is maybe too big a word, but what's puzzling is that The plates, after all, are made of atoms. And just as when I told you about the hydrogen atoms attraction, well, here, some of the electrons in the plates are not even attached to the atoms because they're uh, conductional band electrons. And so you've got, you've got these electrons spread out quite a bit. and um, so all the so the plates can be expected to attract just because of the interactions of the atoms in the plates. And it turns out that Lifshitz did a calculation where he was basically focusing on the atoms in the plates rather than the zero-point oscillations. And he got essentially the same number. So this, there's been a puzzle ever since. Which is it? Is it the zero point energies or is it the interaction of the metals, the atoms and plates? And um, I have had email exchanges with various experts on, on the Casimir effect, and I think they're all schizophrenic um, because they, they say, well, you can look at it either way. And my re reply to them, well, this is stupid because. Uh, because if you can get the result from the, the zero-point oscillations, but you can also get it from the atoms and the metal plates, then you're off by a factor of two. And in fact, this whole calculation then tells you the zero-point energies don't exist at all and should be normally ordered away. Um, now, I, I haven't gotten the experts to agree um, instead, one expert says that uh, you could say that it's not the zero-point energies, it's only the, 
atoms in the flight. <laughs> or you can take the opposite point of view. I don't see how you can possibly take the opposite point of view because the atoms, we know the atoms are there, we know they interact, we know that gives the right answer. So I don't know. It's it's I, I'm, I'm still a bit puzzled about this. And um, are there other configurations besides parallel plates where the Casimir effect can be seen? Right. Yeah. Well, you 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 can imagine concentric plates and so on and so forth. I'm not I'm not up on all the experiments and 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 so forth. I mean. I'm, Theorist, what can I say? Uh, I should know, but I'm. Uh, anyway, it, my understanding is that there are some cases where the thing is repulsive. Whether the experiments have been done, I don't know. I think they have, and they are more or less consistent, but I'm not sure. Um, that's a good question, of course, because. Um, then you can hear about the if, 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 well, it may be that in that geometry, I mean, I expect that in that geometry, the, the atoms wind up repelling each other. I don't know. I haven't worked it out. So in the case where the, where the thing is, let's put it this way. If there's a case where the atoms would attract, the zero point energies would repel, you find out the thing repels experimentally, then that means A, the zero point energies are, are real, and B, that in this particular geometry, they're stronger than the attraction of the atoms if the atoms are attracted. On the other hand, maybe the atoms are repulsive in that geometry. I don't know if that's hard to imagine, but it's conceivable. It's a weird geometry. All right, so what I've done is given you the Avoplana treatment, which at least is a pretty good treatment of the standard Casimir. The, the, the Lifshitz business is quite hard to follow. Um, there's a guy named Maloney, Peter Maloney, who's been in Los Alamos, he's now in <coughs> Rochester, or we said he lives here in New Mexico. Um, his viewpoint is that if you decide to normally order the Hamiltonian, obviously the zero point energy effect goes away, but the atoms and the plates attract in just the right way. If on the other hand you symmetrically order the Hamiltonian, then the zero point energies give the effect, and then he says that the atoms and the plates no longer attract. I don't think he's right about that. And I uh, one little mistake. Well, one mistake, maybe two in his papers. I'm, I'm not sure they're really mistakes. I don't know if they're significant. It's unsettled. He said he'd get back to me in a few days. So. All right, I think it's enough. It's quick.